What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts. I figured out how to unmirror my video on Zoom, so this one is now properly situated. And you can see all of our hard and soil supplements there behind me. We got two new ones coming out this week, Histamine and Immune and Blood Builder. Super stoked about that. They come out on Thursday, which is tomorrow. Obviously, my podcast, Fundamental Health, over there. You can see that. So I'm going to throw around a bunch of stuff today, try and keep this to a shorter controversial thoughts video, but I recorded a podcast yesterday with Peter from Hyperlipid and it was amazing. And there were a couple of really interesting papers in that conversation that I wanted to highlight for you guys, even before that podcast comes out. That podcast will be out in two weeks. Next week, I have a podcast coming out with Dave Feldman. We talked about his oxidized phospholipids experiment, which is super fascinating. I will do probably a controversial thoughts video on lipoprotein little a and lipids between now and then. But check this paper out. So this is one of the more interesting papers that I have seen regarding the polyunsaturated fat versus saturated fat ideas. And the notion that polyunsaturated fats cause inappropriate insulin sensitivity at the level of the mitochondria, leading to essentially adipocyte hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. But that's many steps down the line. So this is a paper looking at the differential metabolic effects of saturated versus polyunsaturated fats in ketogenic diets. If you skip to the results section, I think I looked at this paper briefly with Tommy Wood. I went over it more with Peter in the podcast in two weeks, but I wanted to show you guys this one. The open graphs are saturated. The closed graphs, the gray graphs are polyunsaturated. If you look at this mean change from baseline, at first glance, you might look, you might think that polyunsaturated fats look better because there's more beta hydroxybutyrate. They're making ketones. Ketones are magical, right? There's lower levels of glucose. There's lower levels of insulin. There's lower levels of LDL cholesterol, which we know all know causes atherosclerosis, wink, wink. And uh, there is a lower, there's a uh, further decrease in triglycerides. And if you look at the insulin sensitivity measured, uh, I believe by a clamp test, you can see that polyunsaturated fats caused increased insulin sensitivity. And we want insulin sensitivity, right? Wrong. If you are doing a ketogenic diet, you do not want to be insulin sensitive. Normal human physiology is that you should absolutely be insulin resistant when you are doing a ketogenic diet. That's the whole point of a ketogenic diet is to spare glucose for the red blood cells, the brain, the testicles, the ovaries, the adrenals, the kidneys, things like that that are more glucose dependent than the muscles. You don't want to be insulin sensitive when you are doing a ketogenic diet. So what's really interesting about this experiment in humans is it illustrates the notion that I have been discussing with Brad Marshall, a little bit with the friendly debate with Ben Bickman, and in the podcast coming with Peter from Hyperlipid in two weeks, that saturated fats and polyunsaturated fats do very different things at the level of our mitochondria. If you listen to the podcast with Brad Marshall, you know what I'm talking about here is the F to N ratio, the FADH2 to NADH ratio, which translates into reactive oxygen species, which signal insulin resistance or a stop to the cellular ingress of nutrients, both fat and glucose. And if you have inappropriate continued insulin sensitivity, you will get continued ingress continued importation of glucose and triglycerides and free fatty acids, which leads to glycogen and fatty acid deposition. Your adipocytes will grow. You do not want your cells to be inappropriately insulin sensitive, which this study in a ketogenic diet in humans clearly illustrates the inappropriate persistent insulin sensitivity when ketogenic diets are based on polyunsaturated fats. In the short term, you might think it's good because your ketones are higher or your triglycerides are lower. But what's happening is that your adipocytes are growing or your cells remain inappropriately insulin sensitive. That is what we do not want. That is what saturated fats are supposed to signal in your body by generating reactive oxygen species. So this is human evidence that a lot of the same molecular pathology, molecular mechanisms that I've been discussing, the electron transport chain, I talked about this with Brad Marshall, all these other on ramps in the electron transport chain, complex one, complex two, succinate dehydrogenase, electron transferring flavor protein dehydrogenase, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, all feeding into that Q, the coenzyme Q moiety, 
leading to a backup when things are coming in through complex one, leading to reverse electron transport, generation of superoxide, leading to hydrogen peroxide, and cellular signaling of insulin resistance, which is what your body needs to survive. You would be dead without insulin resistance. It's how your cells signal we're full of nutrients. Polyunsaturated fats create an inappropriate, persistent signal that the cells can accept more nutrients, which is a bad thing. Stuffing your body full of linoleic acid grows your adipocytes. They become hypertrophic. You've listened to the podcast with Ben Bickman and the last controversial thoughts I did, I showed you evidence that linoleic acid metabolites, specifically 4-HNE, 4-hydroxynonanol, are connected with adipocyte hypertrophy, impaired adipogenesis, which is leading to adipocyte hyperplasia, which is the, ex the growth of fat cells by division. That's what you want if you don't want to become insulin resistant pathologically later on. But big fat cells, hypertrophic fat cells get sick, quote unquote, they release inflammatory mediators, they release free fatty acids, and you get metabolic dysfunction. So gradually, polyunsaturated fats push you along the road to metabolic dysfunction. Now, I'm not saying all polyunsaturated fats are bad in all quantity. They're not a toxic thing, but the amount matters. Excess, evolutionarily inconsistent consumption of massive amounts of polyunsaturated fats, specifically linoleic acid, is a signal to your adipocytes to grow, to become hypertrophic, to limit adipogenesis, to limit hyperplasia, to become big and fat and sick. The button bursts on the pants, you get free fatty acids leaked, and that is when metabolic dysfunction, aka metabolic syndrome, aka diabetes, really starts. And that is a problem. That is what you do not want, you guys. That is at the root of chronic disease. Listen to the podcast that released with Chris Kenobi yesterday. We talked about all that. And the real good historical, epidemiological, and anthropologic, and interventional evidence that the, the main driving factor here is excess polyunsaturated fats. You can get that study on polyunsaturated fats and ketogenic diets if you see the reference there, but that is a fascinating thing. Now, because you do not want to remain insulin sensitive when you are on a ketogenic diet. Clear evidence in humans that these mechanisms are in play. This is another fascinating paper. Insulin-induced translocation of CD36 to the plasma membrane is reversible and shows similarity to that of GLUT4. What they're saying here is that if your cells remain insulin sensitive inappropriately, when you are exposed to polyunsaturated fats, you are putting CD36 in the cell membrane. Well, what is CD36 doing? CD36 is one of these proteins that is gonna in, be involved in the ingress of fatty acids, free fatty acids, and it's gonna cause your fat cells to fill up, cause the other cells to fill up with fat. Just like GLUT4 is a glucose transporter that's gonna pull glucose into the cell in response to insulin, CD36 is kind of like a fat transporter. So when you're inappropriately insulin sensitive, you are importing excess glucose, excess fats. Your cells don't have the signal that says, stop, I'm done. You're giving confusing signals to your cells by having massive levels of linoleic acid, which we're not supposed to have evolutionarily because they don't occur in nature. They do not occur in nature. So really interesting stuff there. Now, the other interesting piece of the podcast with Chris Kenobi that we talked about was the notion that humans are living longer today, which is just silly. I actually don't think there's any good evidence we're living any longer today. The life expectancy looks like it's longer because we have uh, a lower infant mortality rate, but that's skewing the data. If you live to adulthood, as I talk about with Chris, the length of the life of a human is about the same today as it was 100 years ago. We have more chronic disease than we, do, than we did then today. That's very clear. And we're living about the same amount of time, but we're living worse. We have less vitality. We have less ability to do the things we'd like to do because we have more chronic disease. So don't be fooled by the notion that we are living longer today. We are living the same. There is lower infant mortality, which makes it look, the average life expectancy look longer, but humans are still living the same amount. We talked about this with Chris, with James Clement, the squaring of the morbidity curve and the fact that as Chris Ryan has talked about in his books, a higher infant mortality rate inappropriately skews the data towards smaller life expectancies historically, which are actually not representative of the amount of time that humans lived. One of my friends, Chris Meister, sent me some pretty cool articles from a, um, a historical source that I'll share with you guys about a, um, and, and, and I guess a Native American gentleman. So this is from the Evening Telegraph, uh, September 15th, 1870. And if you look at this article, you'll see the historical reference. Again, this is just kind of historical interesting. 
to uh, a Native American gentleman called Chick Chickasaba. <laughs> He would frequently bring in for sale at one time as much as 20 gallons of pure honey in deer skins uh, bags slung to his back. So he liked honey too. He was always a firm friend of the whites, a man of gigantic stature and Herculean strength. In his, nine, uh, in his 19th year, uh, he took a wife and by her had two children. In 1831, she died and the old chief did not long survive her, dying the same year, aged 93 or 94. This is in 1831. So this says in his 90th year, not 19th year. In his 90th year, <laughs> he took a young wife. So how cool is that? It's just a historical uh, recounting of a Native American who lived to 93 years old in 1831. Uh, humans have been living long amounts of time for, I would say, the majority of our evolution. We had lower rates of infant mortality today, which is a whole separate issue I can go into in a different podcast. That's probably due to sanitation, antibiotics in childhood, you know, overall uh, progression in terms of the way that women have babies. But the lifespan, the health span of humans has not improved, has not. In fact, I'd say it's gotten shorter because the amount of time that we have vital life is now lower due to the massive increase in chronic disease. Listen to the podcast of Chris Sanobi for a whole lot more about that. So one other thing that sort of came up in the podcast with Peter that we didn't have a whole lot of time to talk about was SARS-CoV-2. Now, I haven't been talking about this much recently because the, honestly, the discussion has just gotten kind of boring to me. I think it's abundantly clear that the things that I've been saying for the last six to seven months are true, that it's our underlying metabolic health that determines how we will respond to this virus. Recent CDC estimates were released showing case fatality rates of less than 0.1%. That's lower than the flu. These are all over the internet. I didn't feel the need to repost, even though I do feel it validates many of the things I was saying from the beginning, be metabolically healthy. It's all about context. How do you become metabolically healthy? Eat animal foods, nose to tail. Eliminate uh, processed seed oils from your diet. If you guys need more nose to tail nutrition, that's what we do at Heart and Soil. You can check us out, heartandsoil.co. If you need desiccated organs, if you can get fresh organs, that's fantastic. But there was recently this article that I saw on Peter's blog, Hyperlipid. Tucker Goodrich also talked about it, discussing the free fatty acid binding pocket uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. What's interesting is that this is linoleic acid. <laughs> And what they say here is that within this binding domain, there are many um, linoleic acid needs. And linoleic acid binding stabilizes the locked, a locked S conformation giving rise to reduced ACE2 in vitro. In human cells, linoleic acid supplementation synergizes with CoV-2 uh, uh, drug remdesivir suppressing SARS-CoV-2 replication, which in a way makes it sound like linoleic acid could be beneficial for fighting SARS-CoV-2. But if you read the end of the paper, there are some interesting things that come out of that as well. We hypothesize that linoleic acid sequestration by SARS-CoV-2 could confer a tissue independent mechanism by, with, by which pathogenic coronavirus infection may drive immune dysregulation and inflammation. Our findings provide a direct structural link between linoleic acid COVID-19 pathology and the virus itself and suggest that both LA binding pocket with an S protein and the multimodal LA signaling access represent excellent therapeutic intervention points against SARS-CoV-2 infections. So ultimately the concern here, which would make sense to me, as you heard in the conversation with Tommy Wood, is that if we are metabolically unhealthy, are we going to have a disordered neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio? Are we going to have disordered immunometabolism? Go back to that podcast if you wanna review that. But ultimately the question is, is our immune system going to be able to respond properly? And could excess linoleic acid also be enabling SARS-CoV-2 to do what it wants to do? I would certainly not be accepting intravenous infusions of linoleic acid if I were in the ICU or if I were administering them to patients in the ICU. I would very much like to see average levels of linoleic acid in the red blood cells or the serum of people in correlation with SARS-CoV-2 outcomes. I think that would be fascinating. Based on everything that I have learned about linoleic acid, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, I think it is very possible that excess linoleic acid could both be used by SARS-CoV-2 to do its signaling in a negative way and to um, be needed for SARS-CoV-2 replication in the body. I would not want my linoleic acid levels to be high. Since we are talking about SARS-CoV-2 again, I'll share a couple other things that are interesting to me. 
Um, one of my friends did this website, Stop COVID Cold. Uh, I think this is a great site. You should check it out. You can check your COVID risk. You can take a quiz, which is actually a really good quiz, which will look at your neutrophil or lymphocyte ratio. And I think this type of thinking about the immunometabolism, the underlying metabolic health that humans can have to, um, to prevent coronavirus infection or prevent severe courses with coronavirus more accurately will be what is needed to change. But that quiz there is pretty freaking amazing. Uh, while we are on the um, sort of the tabloid space of um, the coronavirus conversation, we can find this headline that Elon Musk will, will not be taking a coronavirus vaccine and calls Bill Gates a knucklehead. If you believe the New York Post, uh, Elon Musk said that his, uh, he was not susceptible to coronavirus or concerned for the health of him or his kids, which I thought was a bold statement that I would probably agree with. Uh, I'm not concerned about getting a severe course of coronavirus. I have said this from the very beginning, that if we are metabolically healthy, we will move through this virus with ease. That's what I have seen in all of my friends, everyone that I've known who've had, who's had a coronavirus. I don't know if I've had it or not, it's possible, but uh, I think that if you are metabolically healthy, if you are thinking about your underlying metabolic health, Coronavirus will essentially be a pretty non-issue if you are not nutrient deficient or having under underlying issues. The last thing I want to talk about is a paper that I talked uh, to Chris Noby about, but we didn't have during the podcast. It's this one by Clement Ipp, uh, Fat and Essential Fatty Acid in Mammary Carcinogenesis. What's fascinating in this paper is that you can look at the final incidence of mammary tumors, percent of rats with tumors, and total yield of rats fed diets containing different levels of EFA. The percent EFA here is the percent of linoleic acid. The dietary linoleate is the EFA in this thing. Now you can see that the total number of mammary tumors skyrockets as you go from 0.5% to about 5% uh, linoleic acid in the diet and then levels off. What's interesting is there is a really clear geometric relationship between the incidence of mammary tumors in rats. Again, it's an animal model, but I think many of these animal models involving polyunsaturated fats are highly translatable to humans because they involve many of the same mechanisms at the level of the mitochondrial electron transport chain, NADH levels, cancer growth. I'll talk more about that in the future. I talked about that in the podcast with Brad Marshall, but that when you get to a certain level, the cancer growth levels off. Well, we can't translate this directly to humans, but what percentage of uh, linoleic acid is in the diet of most humans? It's much higher than this. It's probably even beyond 5%, 10, 12, 13% perhaps. So if all of the humans studied are along the flat portion, a high versus a low linoleic acid consumption might not look any different because there is a leveling off in terms of at least this cancer outcome. I suspect the outcomes may be similar for other endpoints, but this is something I talked to Ivor Cummins about that if you're studying populations of humans and you're looking at high versus low levels of linoleic acid, the low group had better have a very low level of linoleic acid, as in an ancestrally low level of linoleic acid, which is around the level of less than 2% or fewer calories from linoleic acid in your diet. If you cannot find people in the population, that would be very hard to find outside of someone in this community or a carnivore community or a very astute nose to tail low linoleic acid community you are not going to be studying a true representation of what I believe to be the spectrum of linoleic acid effects in the human body. So do not be misled by studies of low versus high linoleic acid that do not show a difference if they are all on that sort of flattening out portion of the graph where there's no difference in incidence because they're both still at a toxic level of linoleic acid. So just some musings from this week, some interesting articles. Hopefully that's helpful to you guys. Again, super excited about the release of Gut Indigestion, Firestarter, and now Blood Builder and Histamine and Immune at Heart and Soil. You can check us out, heartandsoil.co. You can always email me, heart, uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Paul at heartandsoil.co. If you have any questions, it's, it's meaningful to me to get more nose to tail nutrition into your life because these are the nutrients that I believe help us thrive as humans. We should not fear animal foods in any way, shape, or form. And there are unique nutrients here. If you can get fresh organs, that's fantastic. But if you can't, I hope that our supplements, which believe me are the highest quality we can find anywhere, and we are developing a US-based supply chain as well, will improve your life. Let us know what you think. Dr. Paul, Dr. Paul, hardandsoil.co. You guys are all part of the remembering. It's something I continue to think about. This concept continues to resonate with me that we cannot ignore. We simply cannot ignore where we have come from as humans. We cannot be 
we cannot fall victim to the amnesia of 2020. There are so many aspects of what it means to be a human that we cannot forget. So thank you for being a part of the remembering. If this resonates with you, I, let me know. And thank you for, all, for your support. And still, you should always still stay radical.